How has the M1 MacBook Pro been for me over the past few months as a full-time YouTuber? This is the machine in question, a 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro in a cool space gray. On the outside, it looks the same as the old Intel model, but on the inside, it's brand new. Built using a five nanometer process and containing 16 billion transistors, the M1 chip is full of custom technologies designed for high performance using the least amount of power. This tiny M1 chip indeed represents a huge leap for laptops and is the future for the Mac. And I'm hoping it's the future for me and my creative endeavors, which at the moment include editing hours of 4K video in Final Cut Pro, editing hundreds of raw files in Darkroom and Lightroom. I run my website on Squarespace, I write scripts, I do research, and I handle all of the business and admin side of things as well. And I think this is a pretty standard workflow for someone in my position making the type of videos that I make. And that's the whole point of this review. I'm offering like a more normal person's perspective. You know, I don't have a £20,000 Mac Pro lying around to compare this thing to. I've not got like 8K raw footage to edit or all of the apps to compare and benchmark. In fact, before I got the M1 in November 2020, I was using this beaten up old Retina MacBook Pro from 2015. Yes, this five-year-old base model machine can edit 4K video. So if you're in a similar sort of position to me, maybe you are using an older machine as well that's just kind of hanging in there and your workflow is similar to mine, then you should find some value in this review. So let's quickly mention specs. This machine has 16 gigabytes of memory, 256 gigabytes of storage. It comes with two Thunderbolt 3 ports, one headphone jack, and the whole thing costs £1,499, which I think is a bargain. So what do you get for your money? Well, you get a little beast. A little beast that hardly weighs anything and you can carry around in your bag. It eats through my workflow without even trying, which isn't exactly surprising when you see other videos of this thing outperforming that £20,000 Mac Pro with 96 gigabytes of RAM and 12 cores. 4K S-Log3 from my Sony a7 III scrubs and plays back a buttery smooth in Final Cut Pro. And that's graded, that's with better quality viewing, that's with an external monitor, and that's with an all original media workflow. Not optimized, no proxies, and not pre-rendered. And it's the same thing with the notoriously difficult iPhone video. You hear horror stories of some really expensive, really high-end Intel Macs just being crippled by this iPhone footage. But this M1 Mac with 150 megabits per second files, with 10-bit files, again, original media, graded, no problem. Just buttery smooth playback, buttery smooth scrubbing. And it's bliss compared to the old Retina MacBook, which, as I said, could edit the footage, but it had to use an optimized workflow, which meant waiting for everything to analyze and transcode and having to pre-render almost everything before it would play back. It also meant very loud fan noise and a lot of heat a lot of the time. Whereas the M1 is super silent. Seriously, nothing that I've done in Final Cut Pro so far has made the fan come on even once. This is like layers of 4K video, color grading, effects, plugins, transitions, pictures, graphics, everything. But the computer, it must think it's in a library or something because it's just been, it's just been perfectly quiet. Export times are also great. Like for a 15 minute 4K project, I'm looking at about 10 minutes and 12 seconds for an export. All of this performance means that I can work faster, I can complete videos faster, which means you get them faster, and it also means I can work less, I'm less stressed, I can get more sleep, and I can spend more time with my wife, which is invaluable. Something else that's allowed me to work much faster is the ability to perform multiple tasks at once without compromise. For example, a lot of my videos have still photographs in them, and whereas before I had to edit them separately, I can now edit 
them in Darkroom and Lightroom on one screen and have Final Cut Pro open on the other all running perfectly smoothly. The M1 turns the typically slow and sluggish Adobe Lightroom Classic into the fast and responsive Adobe Lightroom Classic. There's no more click and wait, click, lag, click, beach ball. You get to watch the beach ball go round and round. When almost every click results in a lag or a beach ball, you just don't want to edit your photos, but thankfully there is none of that here. Even though Lightroom hasn't been updated to fully take advantage of the M1 at the time of recording, it's still a really fast, really responsive experience running on Apple's translation software, Rosetta 2. There are a few situations where Lightroom was taking so long to do something, I would leave it and then come back to it later, but no longer. Importing 134 14-bit uncompressed Sony A7 III RAW files, for example, takes just over one minute. And then converting them to DNG just takes a further minute. And copying edits from one photo to the 133 others takes under five seconds. And finally, exporting them all at full res and full quality takes just four and a half minutes. In fact, exporting a large amount of photos in Lightroom is the only thing that I've done so far that has caused the M1's fan to come on. But the moment the export is finished, it quickly cools down and turns itself off. This, by the way, is one of the new presets I'm working on. Now, it doesn't involve the sliders at all. It is purely tone curve and colors, which leaves you a lot of flexibility to adapt the preset to your own photos. Now, this isn't available at the moment, but you can still get Pasek Pack 1 at PasekalMau.com. You can also use my presets in Photoshop, which too hasn't been updated for the M1, but it's still fast and responsive like Lightroom, as are the other apps that I use, such as Darkroom and Affinity Photo, both of which have been updated to take advantage of the M1, by the way. So that's Indie Developers 1, giant billion dollar corporation, zero. Now you might have noticed that this review has involved a lot of screen recordings. Now previously with the Retina MacBook Pro, I would have to record the screen via my iPad because the Retina Mac just couldn't handle it. The fans would scream and whichever app I was using would just lag into oblivion. Do you think that happens with the M1? If you said no, then you are correct. Well done you. Now, all of this great performance must use tons of battery life, right? No, it really, really doesn't. And this is really important to me because even though right now, the M1 spends most of its time next to a plug, I do intend to take my channel all around the UK and all around the world when I can. That means doing all of this on flights, on long journeys. I could end up in the middle of nowhere. I'm really looking forward to it because I'm pleased to report that the M1 is like, it's like a marathon runner. It just goes and goes and goes. For menial admin tasks, the M1 sips power like it's sipping a, a boiling hot coffee. I usually experience around a 10% drop per hour when I'm doing stuff like typing in pages or researching Safari while listening to music. With bigger apps like Final Cut Pro and Lightroom, I'm still getting a solid like eight hours every single day. I can start work at say half 10 in the morning and not have to charge up until half past six in the evening. So the battery goes down really slowly, but it charges up really quickly thanks to the 61 watt charger that comes in the box. Now I know power outlets are different all around the world, but my experience in the UK has been that I can go from 1% to 100% in just under three hours. And that's while I'm using it. So I'm really thankful that wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, I don't have to worry about the battery. I can just focus on what I'm doing. There are some other cool things that I really appreciate as well, like how the speakers sound. The screen brightness. comfortable keyboard, and even though it's not perfect, I like the touch bar too. Downsides to the M1 MacBook Pro. Um, well, apparently, if you're an Adobe Premiere user, 
um, good luck. <laughs> the only downside that I've come across is some of the plugins that I use in Final Cut Pro haven't been updated to work with Apple Silicon yet. But apart from that, that's for me personally, that's that's pretty much the only thing. And what gets me excited is, like I said, my workflow doesn't even challenge this thing. And there's clearly a lot of overhead to grow into. I don't plan on swapping my Sony a7 III anytime soon, but I do plan on getting faster memory cards so I can shoot at 100 megabits per second instead of 60 megabits per second. And I might get more ambitious with my plugins, with my effects and transitions, that sort of thing. And I know when I do, it's gonna work fine. I won't have to compromise. And like barring any major changes to my workflow, I probably won't have to compromise for at least another five years. So I'm very happy. And as I said, if you have a similar workflow to me, if you're in a similar position to me, then you should be happy too. Thanks for watching, Be seek out.